So, Dr. Charette, we're glad that you're here, and uh, we welcome you come to the podium, begin our first session today. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Vern Charette? Hey, brother. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen. It is always a joy to be here. That might be the kindest introduction he's ever given me, praise the Lord. So, uh, when Dr. Allen asked me if I would lead off, uh, I think he knew that he would be putting a tremendous amount of pressure on me because, well, to use a baseball metaphor, when you're the leadoff man, you're expected to get some results. There's no doubt about it. And so, uh, I am excited. By the way, speaking of results, it reminds me of a story I heard about two men that died and they were standing before the pearly gates of heaven. St. Peter was standing there. One of them had driven a taxi cab in New York for a number of years. And uh, he was allowed to enter the kingdom of, of, of heaven through the gates there. But b before he entered, he was granted a, a golden crown and a silk robe. And uh, the man standing behind him was a Baptist preacher. Had been preaching <laughs> the word for a number of years. And he was only granted not a, a golden crown and a silk robe, but he was granted a, um, a wooden crown and a cotton robe. And so when this transpired, of course, he, uh, he, he, he questioned uh, St. Peter, you know. Uh, uh, he said, hey, uh, you know, what gives here? Uh, this man drove a taxi cab in New York City for a number of years, and he's given a golden crown and a silk robe, and I preached the word for 40 years. I preached the Bible for 40 years, and I'm only granted a wooden crown and a cotton robe. What's the deal? And uh, St. Peter said, well, up here, it's all about results. It's all about results. He said, he said, when you preached, you caused people to go to sleep. When he drove, he caused people to pray. <laughs> and so it's all about results. And so I'm going to do my best to present the material, and we'll, we will leave the results to the Lord. And so uh, I want you to know it's a joy uh, for me to be here today. Uh, my title is Many Roads, One De Destination, Charting the Course from the Old Testament to Christ. Many roads, one destination, charting the course from the Old Testament to Christ. You should have a handout there. I, uh, just one page. Uh, some of you might want to follow along. At a minimum, you've got a skeleton outline there that you can follow along uh, uh, in terms of the presentation and that kind of thing. And so uh, let me begin by just asking the Lord to just bless our time today, not only this session, but also the rest of the day, and that the Holy Spirit of God, who is the paraclete, would give us a word. Father... We love you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you that, Father, you have revealed yourself. We come together as um, conservatives, evangelicals that believe in the inspiration, the infallibility, the eternal nature of the Word of God. And um, we have a high view of Scripture knowing that, Father, that it reveals Christ, knowing that, Father, that uh, Christ ultimately reveals you, Father. And in that we delight. In fact, I even pray that today, Father, you would make yourself known and seen. That we might magnify and glorify you in all of your um, holiness and righteousness and love and mercy and grace. And all those wonderful attributes that you eternally possess, Father. We praise you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Please be with us today, Lord. We want to see Jesus. And we ask you to just grant these things in the precious and strong and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Many roads, one destination, charting the course from the Old Testament to Christ. Uh, the first thing that I want to, want to do today in terms of introduction is I want to give you three reasons that our subject matter, namely preaching Christ from the Old Testament, is important for us to consider today. In other words, why are we here? <laughs> you know, why have we gathered together? And so, uh, being a good Baptist, I've got three reasons <laughs> that um, I want to begin with. And the first reason is, is we are experiencing a decline in evangelistic preaching. Now, when I say we, I'm primarily talking about us as Southern Baptist. Um, but I truly believe that we are experiencing a decline in evangelistic preaching, especially among our pastors. There has been a rise, praise the Lord, in expository preaching. 
focusing in on the text, preaching the pericope that lies before us, communicating that to our audience. But with that, with that emphasis, which is great and wonderful, um, uh, a lot of pastors are having a hard time then moving from passages to what we call drawing the net or moving from certain passages that don't seem to explicitly uh, address evangelistic issues to an evangelistic invitation. And so you might say, well, uh, Dr. Charette, what does evangelistic preaching have to do with preaching Christ from the Old Testament? Well, it has to do uh, with it in a tremendous way. In, it has to do um, with it tremendously. There are three essential ingredients to evangelistic preaching, okay? Three essential ing ingredients. If you're going to uh, preach evangelistically, number one, you need to let your audience know that they're sinners, for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. Number two, you must com communicate to your audience that Christ Jesus died for them. They must know that Christ Jesus is their atonement. He is the one that paid the penalty for their sin. And then number three, they must be told to trust in Christ. They must be told, and with that, of course, that carries the idea of, of repentance and faith. And so, number one, they must be told that they're sinners. They must be told that Christ Jesus died for them. And then number three, they must be told to trust in Christ. Well, obviously, Jesus Christ is the sine qua non. He is um, absolutely um, necessary uh, if you're going to do evangelistic preaching. So, if you remove Christ then you cannot do evangelistic preaching. In other words, if you're not preaching Christ, you're not doing evangelistic preaching. And so um, since we are experiencing a decline in evangelistic preaching, I think if we come together and we focus in on, turn our attention to how we move from especially Old Testament passages to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that is going to help us tremendously in drawing the net in our churches. And again, I just want to encourage you as a pastor um, with the decline of the use of evangelists today in our convention, uh, the, the onus lies even more upon us to draw the net and preach evangelistically. So I think it's important for us to gather and um, to turn our attention to this important talk topic. Number two, there is a proliferation of practicing Martianites uh, in our churches. A proliferation of what I call practicing Martianites. Uh, which avoid the Old Testament in favor of the New. You remember Martian, right? The second century heretic that um, bifurcated between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament to the extent that he threw out the Old Testament canon and said all we need is the New Testament. Of course, he was labeled a heretic. Uh, well, listen, modern preachers would never confess the same theological reason as Martian. But... Um, Oftentimes, they avoid the Old Testament because they simply don't know how to mine the exegetical riches and apply them to a new covenant audience. And so we are practicing Martianites when we avoid the Old Testament in favor of the New just because we know how to handle the New Testament and how to handle Christology, particularly from the New Testament. And again, I think if we come together and we focus in on preaching Christ from the Old Testament, it will help us preach evangelistically. And then number two, it will help us handle the Old Testament. Learning how to make a Christological connection will help tremendously in this. And then number three, it's a trending theological issue with several implications. Uh, frankly, it's a hot topic, preaching Christ from the Old Testament. Testament. Uh, if you do an internet search, just Google Christ-centered preaching or just Google preaching Christ from the Old Testament and you will see literally uh, scores, myriads of, of um, hits um, with not only a number of um, articles uh, on the internet but also you'll find videos there. Um, uh, men coming together like Brian Chappell sitting with uh, John Piper and, and others and, and them discussing this important topic. So um, it, you're going to find articles, you're going to find um, presentations, you're going to find papers. If you attend ETS uh, or EHS, the Evangel Evangelical Homiletical Society, um, oftentimes you'll find uh, this topic presented. And so um, 
uh, it, is a, it is no doubt a hot topic. And um, with a risk of sounding sensational here, um, I want you to know that I think that also it has eternal implications as well. I think that we're talking about something that has eternal ramifications. Uh, I think that the devil is fine with us preaching moralistic, do better, try harder sermons that are void of Christ and how to obtain his imputed righteousness. I think the devil's fine with us opening up the Old Testament and say, here's David, be more like him. Or here's Saul, don't be like him. Or here's such and such in, in this portion of the Old Testament, be like him or don't be like him. Or let's try harder to be like I think the devil's fine with that kind of preaching. But when you turn it into redemptive preaching, when you turn the focus from the text to Christ and start talking to people about how they can receive the imputed righteousness of Christ, then, my friend, um, you are going to make a mark for the kingdom of God. And so um, it's, it's vital for us, again, to come together today to focus our attention on preaching Christ from the Old Testament, sometimes called christ Center preaching. Why? because we're experiencing a decline in evangelistic preaching. Number two, there's a proliferation of practicing Martianites in our churches. And number three, it's a trending theological issue with several implications. Okay? Uh, now, with that front porch, uh, let's move into the house. And the first thing I want to do today is I want to show you the landscape by highlighting some of the points of disagreement as we talk about Christ-centered preaching. Now, I emphasize the word some because... Uh, I literally could spend the rest of my time just talking to you about uh, some of the issues and the points of disagreements, but um, I I'm giving you these points not to be, um, um, not to give you every single point of contention. Um, uh, so uh, that being the case, let me give you some points of disagreement, okay? And so the, here's, here's the first question. What exactly are we talking about when we advocate, Dr. Allen has already told you that we on the faculty here um, certainly advocate preaching Christ from the Old Testament, but the question is, is what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about that? Uh, you might think, well, that's very simple, isn't it? Well, no, that's where there is a bone of contention among uh, the scholars and, um, and those that have an interest in this topic. Are we talking about, number one, preaching Christ at the expense of the text before us? No, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about ignoring the pericope, the passage that is before us. Uh, we're not talking about opening up the Old Testament and using bad hermeneutics to take whatever text it is and to find ourselves preaching Christ, making the Bible a flat book, flat book um, doing away with the idea of progressive revelation and focusing in on the pericope that lies before us. That's not what we're talking about. So we're not talking about preaching Christ at the expense of the text before us. We're text-driven preachers. Uh, we believe in opening up the text and preaching what's there and dealing with that in a biblical, biblically sound way. So we're not talking about preaching Christ at the expense of the text before us. Number two, are we talking about tacking the gospel on to the end of our sermons with no warrant from the text? Is that what we're talking about when we're talking about Christ-centered preaching? In other words, let me preach a sermon, let me preach a sermon, let me preach a sermon. Here's the text, here's the text, here's the text. I've exhausted what I'm going to say about this text in the Old Testament. Now, time out. Let me preach another sermon. Let me start another mini-sermon on Jesus Christ. Let me tack Jesus on to the end of this sermon and make no hermeneutical connection, build no hermeneutical bridge whatsoever. Is that what we're talking about? Too many sermons, maybe a long sermon over the text, and then just a short mini sermon over Christ. Is that what we're talking about when we're talking about um, preaching Christ from the Old Testament? Well, no, we're not talking about preaching a separate mini, mini sermon. We're talking about moving in a hermeneutically sound and legitimate way from the text and the sermon that we've been preaching to the Lord Jesus Christ and how we get there, okay? So we're not talking about just tacking the gospel on to the end of our sermons with no warrant. Number three, are we talking about forcing Jesus into the pericope or into the passage that we're preaching by eisegesis? 
Is that what we're talking about here? Let me just sort of shoehorn Jesus into every single text that I'm preaching. Uh, regardless of whether he's there or not, even maybe using something like allegory to find him there. Is that what we're talking about when we're talking about Christ-centered preaching? And so I really don't necessarily see the connection with this text in Leviticus or this text in Deuteronomy or this text in Exodus or this text in Numbers or whatever it may be. I really don't see the connection between this text and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let me shoehorn him in here. Let me, let me use a little allegory here. Is that what we're talking about? Using bad hermeneutics to make sure that we preach Christ. I'm going to, going to build a bridge. Uh, is it a hermeneutically sound bridge? No, but I'm going to do it because I'm, I'm a Baptist. And uh, we have a, um, uh, a, a history of preaching Christ in our, uh, our denomination, what I call um, a gospel, gospel-centered hermeneutic, which, by the way, is, is tremendous. But we're not talking about forcing Jesus into a pericope by eisegesis, reading something, forcing something into the text. Obviously, we're not talking about that, even though it's been done. Well, are we talking about then, number four, merely mentioning Jesus' name in the sermon? I mean, is that considered, does that qualify as Christ-centered preaching if I just am preaching a sermon and I just merely mention Jesus is that does that qualify or to qualify uh, must we preach all the aspects of Christology <laughs> must must I to qualify for doing Christ-centered preaching from the Old Testament or preaching Christ from the Old Testament must I talk about his eternal nature his virgin birth his death burial and resurrection his ascension and a second coming. See, there's confusion over how much we have to talk about uh, for it to qualify as being Christ-centered or preaching Christ from the Old Testament. Well, the answer is given to us. I think Sidney Gradanus uh, is on target when he says this. And by the way, I'm drawing a lot from Gradanus as well. I'll go through the books hopefully here near the end. Uh, so that you can go out and um, purchase some of these or do some further reading. But um, Sidney Gradanus is on target when he says this. He answers that question. How much do we um, uh, have to preach in terms of Christ for it to qualify as a text-driven sermon? And here's what he says. He says, to preach Christ is to proclaim some facet of the person, work, or teaching of Jesus of Nazareth, so that people may believe him, trust him, love him, and obey him. Some facet, enough that people may trust Christ, and enough that people may uh, believe in him, or love him, or obey him. Here's how he defines preaching Christ. I like this. This is even more concise or lucid. He, he defined preaching Christ as, quote, preaching sermons which authentically integrate the message of the text with the climax of God's revelation in the person, work, and or teaching of Jesus Christ as revealed in the New Testament. Okay? So I like the fact that he uses the word preaching sermons which, which authentically integrate the message of the text with the climax of God's revelation in Christ. He uses that word authentically because, again, He's uh, giving a nod to those that would do it in an inauthentic way. And uh, so um, we're talking about preaching um, Christ Jesus, his person, his work, his teaching to the extent that it causes you to trust Christ. Enough that causes you to understand who we're talking about here in terms of the second person of the Godhead and enough to say, you know what, I need to trust him um, for whatever this text is um, is um, advocating that I need to trust him for. All right, so um, those are a few of the things we are not talking about necessarily. We're not talking about preaching Christ at the expense of the text before us. We're not talking about tacking Jesus onto the end of our sermons with no warrant from the text. We are not talking about forcing Jesus into the pericope by eisegesis. Jesus. 
we're not talking about merely mentioning Jesus' name in a sermon. It, it, to do Christ-centered preaching is more than that. However, we're also not saying that you have to preach um, the whole swath of Christology in order to, um, to qualify. And I'll let you continue to wrestle with that um, uh, as we uh, move throughout the day. All right, so what exactly are we talking about? That's um, um, uh, one of the points of disagreement. Uh, number two, another point of disagreement. Does every sermon have to be Christ-centered? Does every, and I emphasize the word every there, does every sermon have to be Christ-centered? In other words, every time we preach the Old Testament, are we expected to preach Jesus Christ from that text? Uh, even Sunday night addresses. Uh, for the, some of us, the few of us that still preach on Sunday night, uh, even Wednesday night addresses. When we gather together on a Wednesday night and our faithful few, that remnant, comes together on Wednesday night, you know, the pillars of the church, uh, even on a Wednesday night when I'm teaching or preaching through the Old Testament, am I expected to uh, preach Christologically from that text? And you see, there's the point of contention. Because those that are in opposition to preaching Christ from the Old Testament, those that would say, hey, um, uh, you know, we do not agree with your position on preaching Christ from the Old Testament, they don't have a problem with preachers doing it some of the time or even much of the time. They have a problem with preachers doing it all of the time. Uh, I literally was at an ETS meeting and, um, and um, heard um, uh, my colleague, Dr. Stephen Smith, um, he was taken to task for his position on preaching Christ from um, um, the Old Testament, preaching Christ from the Old Testament in every single sermon uh, by a um, preaching professor in one of our sister seminaries who, again, holds this position. This position is simply stated like this. Well, I think you should do Christ-centered preaching much of the time, but just not every time, especially, again, if it's a Sunday night address or a Wednesday night address and you're just preaching to your faithful few that are there and you know that you don't have any lost people in there, I don't think it's necessarily necessary. And then some would also cite hermeneutical reasons. I just don't think that every single Christ is connected or points to in a Christocentric way or a teleocentric way to Christ Jesus. And so, uh, but again... One of the main uh, um, arguments that they cite is, I just don't th think that you should do it all the time. Ken Langley, uh, his article is found in this um, EHS volume here, journal. Um, Ken, Lang Ken Langley is one of the guys I'll be interacting with a little bit. Um, he says this, and um, he uh, basically states the position very candidly. He says, if it were not for this insistence that every sermon be Christ-centered, I'd have far less disagreement with those who advocate Christocentric preaching. So what Langley is saying is, look, I don't have a problem with it some of the time or part of the time or much of the time. It's just the fact that you guys say that we should do it in every single sermon. Um, Abe Curavilla uh, his name will be mentioned, I'm sure, by my colleagues a little bit later and the rest of the, the rest of the, the rest of the, uh, the day. Uh, by the way, uh, Dr. Carvilla is coming in to do our preaching comp, our, our preaching lectures, and so I want to encourage everyone to stick around for the next few days and to, and to hear Dr. Curavilla come in. But he's even more candid when he says this: "In preaching, perhaps, it is not an absolute essential that every sermon be Christocentric." especially if the chosen pericope does not actually point to Christ in that fashion. That's it from his book, Privilege, the Text. And by the way, it's a great book. Um, I agree with Curavilla on a number of issues. Uh, he directs our attention to studying and doing um, exegesis from the text and focusing in on each pericope that we're preaching, theologically drawing from the pericope before us. All of that is great. But um, frankly, it's enough for Curavilla if Christ is spoken of in the music, prayers, and ordinances of the church service 
even if he's not spoken of directly in the sermon. Did you hear what I said? And so, again, Curabella would say, um, you know, it's the fact that you are saying that we are to preach Christ from every single text. That's the problem I have. And he would say, you know, when we come together um, in our church worship services, Christ is going to be mentioned in the prayers. Christ is going to be mentioned in the singing. Christ is going to be mentioned uh, in the testimonies and that kind of thing. Um, and so that's enough. You don't have to mention him, mention him in every single sermon. Uh, one writer lamented Christ-centered preaching by quoting a layman that said this. this. They were basically giving us the psychology of the average layman out there. Here comes that Jesus bit again. Now, um, let me just respond to this. Again, uh, respond to this idea that every sermon have to be Christ-centered. Um, every single sermon. Well, let me ask you something. Can we ever exhaust the riches that are found in the person and the work of our Savior, Jesus Christ? Can we ever expound the beauty that is found in the second person of the Godhead? Absolutely not. He is an inexhaustible well from which we can draw. He will run, run dry when God runs dry, uh, which is never and does a Christian ever grow weary of hearing all about his Savior's victory on the cross? Now listen, something is wrong if you're tired of hearing about Jesus. Uh, let me just tell you something. I'm 25 years old in the Lord, plus. And um, I agree with um, one of our great Southern Baptist preachers that used to say this. I'd rather go to heaven singing Jesus loves me than go to hell spouting philosophy. And guys, let me just tell you this. I've got a PhD. Let me just tell you this. I never grow weary of hearing Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And so uh, where is a person at spiritually who would mutter to him or herself, here comes that Jesus bed again. Uh, you've got a deeper problem than, than just uh, not believing that the preacher is handling uh, the text correct hermeneutically. Uh, you're either radically lost or radically backslidden uh, to, uh, to, to, to mutter those kinds of words. And by the way, what if a person just happens, what if a lost person just happens to come in on a Sunday night? What if a lost person just happens to come in on a Wednesday night? God forbid when I was a high school dropout and I was in trouble with the law and I was living an immoral life, when I wandered into that little storefront church, when that black preacher that was standing up there preaching the gospel, God forbid that he didn't say that, you know what, this text doesn't directly relate to Christ and there's no need for me to be Christ-centered in this particular sermon because as I look out, mainly I'm preaching to home folks anyway. God forbid that he said that. What if a lost person just happens to come in and to hear us preach? And, and then what about, you ready for this? What about unregenerate church membership? <laughs> I mean, we lament this all the time, but we've got a lot of lost people in our churches. And let me just tell you something. If they go to hell, let them climb over a plethora of sermons that we preach where every single Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, we took the text, and like Spurgeon said, we headed straight for Calvary. Now, we want to do that in a legitimate way, but God forbid that we should sell our unregenerate church membership short by giving them the benefit of the doubt. And so, uh, my answer to does every sermon have to be Christ centered? Every Old Testament sermon? Uh, does it, um, do we need to address? Christ and talk about Christ every Sunday night and Wednesday night and Sunday morning that we preach? Yes, indeed it does. Well, number three, again, we're talking about um, uh, some of the points of disagreement. Uh, what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about preaching Christ? Does every sermon have to be Christ-centered, every single one of them? And then number three, isn't theocentric preaching from the Old Testament, isn't that enough? 
That's a major argument from those that oppose Christocentric preaching or Christ-centered preaching from the Old Testament. Um, after all, they say, these opponents, there are some dangers that can be avoided if one takes a theocentric approach as opposed to a Christocentric one. You can avoid some hermeneutical dangers and um, uh, you can be more accurate with the text. In other words, isn't it enough for me to just preach God? Isn't it enough to me just preach what God is revealing about himself in the text? Isn't it, isn't it enough for me to preach on the Father, they would say, and not necessarily talk about the Son? Well, again, Ken Langley argued for a theocentric approach in his award-winning paper presented, here it is, at EHS in 2008. In this paper, Ken Langley presents five concerns or dangers with Christocentric preaching. And one of his primary concerns was with and I quote, a shrinking theology and reverence for the Father. So in other words, Ken Langley is saying, hey, here's the issue. If you continually preach the second person of the Godhead, the second person of the Godhead, if you continue to be Christocentric in every sermon, then you're going to have a shrinking theology and reverence for the Father. Uh, to preach God, they would say, is enough. To preach the Father, they say, uh, is enough, especially if preaching from the Old Testament where they say perhaps Christ Jesus is not explicitly found. Theocentric preaching, however, is not enough. And so when one is employing Christ-centered preaching from the Old Testament, no one is advocating this to the exclusion of preaching God the Father. Uh, this bifurcation of the Godhead is, first of all, it's extremely rare in Christocentric circles. And number two, those that are Christocentric preach, preach Christ in relation to His Father. I just, I don't know where, I, I, in fact, I, I, I believe in many ways it's a straw man argument. If you preach Christ the Son, God the Father will be excluded. And there'll be a diminishing of understanding um, the theology proper role of God the Father. Uh, that bifurcation is just not anything that I've ever seen. I just don't know where they're getting that. I don't think that that's being done. And so um, this bifurcation of the Godhead, I said, is extremely rare. And I would add this, if it's there at all. Um, those that are Christocentric, those of us that preach Christ, preach Christ in relation to His Father. And so we're not saying either or. We're saying both and, making sure that you preach God the Son. Okay? And so, number two, to preach an Old Testament pericope in its historical, literary, and canonical context will involve preaching the Father. Okay? So, again, if you preach Christ, if you preach the text, if you honor the canonical, the um, literary, the historical context in the Old Testament. Are you ready for this? You will preach the Father. But you'll also preach Christ in relation to His Father. Where, el where else will the second person of the Godhead and how else can He be preached if He's not preached in relation to the Father? And so many would agree with Graham Goldsworthy's summation in his chapter. And I agree with this. In his chapter, Can I Preach a Christian Sermon Without Mentioning Jesus? Here's what Graham Goldsworthy says. The simple answer is a resounding no. He said, why would you even want to preach a Christian sermon without mentioning Jesus? Is there anywhere else we can look to see God? End quote. I love that. Now, I would tweak that a little bit because there are some places you can look to see God. First of all, you can go to Romans 1 and um, you can see God in creation. You can see God in, con in your conscience. You know, creation and conscience. You know that He's there. You know something of the Godhead. Um, you can see God in the Old Testament. Particularly, you can see God the Father in the Old Testament. You can see God in the New Testament. So I, would th I think I would tweak that just a little bit to say, 
where else better can you see God? Or more clearly, can you see God other than in the face of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Christ reveals the Father. To preach Christ is to reveal the Father. Let me show you something. Some of you brought your Bibles. You're good, good Baptist, all right? Uh, John 1, some of you, you don't have to turn there. Many of you have this um, uh, memorized. But John chapter 1, verse 18. And by the way, you remember how John begins? Um, In the beginning was halagos, the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. And then the Bible talks about, and the Word became flesh. Remember that? Literally in the Greek, the Word tabernacled with us. Okay? And so we're talking about the eternal person, second person, if you will, of the Godhead becoming flesh, the incarnation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then look what John says in verse 18. I love this. He says, um, no one has seen God at any time. Now, um, that's a loaded theological statement by John. It might be elementary in Greek, but he just loaded it up right there, okay? Uh, No one has seen God. What he's talking about there is no one has seen the full essence of God in the Old Testament. You might have a Christophany, uh, a Theophany. You might have have manifestations of God, a burning bush for Moses, um, the hinder parts of God passing by for Moses. You might have something like that. But no one looks unadulterated upon the essence of God the Father. No one has seen God. That's a loaded statement. It's true. Look what he says. No one has seen God. By the way, also ontologically, God is a spirit. It's another reason you haven't seen God. Oh, also, he dwells in unapproachable light. That's another reason you haven't seen God. Oh, another reason. It would kill you. That's another reason you haven't seen God. Oh, but by the way, verse 18, no one has seen God at any time, but I love this. Um, No one has seen God at any time, but look at this. He says, uh, the only begotten God, some of your translations might say the only begotten Son there, um, uh, the word there is um, that word for unique, um, the only begotten, the monogenes, the unique, watch this, Son, who's in the bosom of the Father, he has what? Explained him. Exegeomai. Exogeomai. I love that. Exegeomai. He has explained him. The Son has explained the Father. That word exegeomai comes from, it's a derivative um, of two Greek words. Ek, which means out of. And ago, which means I lead. And so God the Son leads out God the Father for us. The English derivative of this Greek word is our term. You ready for this? Exegesis. I love that. You ready for this? No one has seen God at any time, but God the Son exegetes the Father for us. He takes the Father, much like we exegete the text and make it known to our people. He takes the Father and makes Him known to us. That's why we preach Christ Jesus, even from the Old Testament. And I like what my colleague, Dr. Stephen Smith, says. We represent the text. The text represents Jesus. Jesus represents the Father. And so again I say, where can you look to see God in a more clear fashion than in the person, the second person of the Godhead? May Dr. Allen get up here and wax eloquent on Hebrews 1-3 for us a little bit later. Which says that Jesus is the express image of the Father. He's the express image. Let me put it this way, okay? Let me give it to you in Burns vernacular here. You ready for this? If God the Father was looking in the mirror, God the Son would be His reflection. If God the Son was looking in a mirror, God the Father would be His reflection. He's the express image of the Father. And so, 
uh, to preach Christ is to reveal the Father again. I think that this bifurcating between the two is a straw man. We shouldn't worry about that. Preach Jesus because Jesus reveals the Father. Okay? So, again, so far what we've done is just showed you the landscape by highlighting some of the points of disagreement. What exactly are we talking about when we advocate preaching Christ from the Old Testament? Um, and that kind of thing, okay? So let's move to our second major point. I've shown you the landscape, and I've highlighted some of the points of disagreement. And um, so second, let's, um, let's, shed, let's shed some light on the roads that lead from Christ, uh, for, lead from the Old Testament to Christ, okay? Let's shed some light on this by answering the how question with the help of Sidney Gradanus' Preaching Christ from the Old Testament, and here it is. By the way, I read it so you don't have to. No, no. Uh, by the way, that's for sale back there. But this, this is one of the better works on preaching Christ from the Old Testament. Really, in many ways, it's a hermeneutical work. Uh, but in this, Sidney Gradanus gives us six ways to move from the Old Testament to Jesus Christ in the New. Okay. Now, again, if you're kind of tracking with me, hopefully you already believe that we should do it. Um, you know, the why and why we should do it has been answered for you, but here's the how. And so let's walk through these six um, ways that we can move from the Old Testament to Christ um, um, through the help and with the help of Sidney Gradanus. The first way is the way of redemptive historical progression, okay? And this is the primary way. Um, this is um, the same way that uh, Graham, Graham Goldsworthy, it's the same way that he outlines in his book, whereas Graham Goldsworthy majors on this, um, Sidney Gradanus would agree, but just add some more to it. And by the way, the others are actually built on this uh, redemptive historical progression. And so this is the way it works, okay? Redemptive historical links Christ to Old Testament redemptive events which find their climax in Him, okay? With this method, the preacher approaches the Old Testament narrative or his pericope with a wide-angle canonical lens, making much of where the passage fits into the overall redemptive plan of God that climaxes in Christ. Okay, did you get that? Uh, in other words, you approach the text from, an, a, from a canonical standpoint. When you're opening up the Old Testament... You understand and you uh, believe that this particular passage that I'm preaching, this narrative, this pericope, is not isolated by itself. You understand that this Old Testament narrative actually fits into a broader meta-narrative. Uh, you approach the text by, instead of taking that story of Samson or whatever it may be, editing, cutting it, sticking it on the clipboard... And just dealing with it by itself, instead of doing that, um, you understand that the story of Samson fits into a larger canonical framework. And so basically the way of redemptive historical progression is Graham Goldsworthy and Gradanus' way of, of saying from Barashit bara Elohim, from in the beginning God created all the way through the, the apocalypse and even into the maps, you have one historical redemptive story that is being told. And every single pericope, every single passage fits into this larger scheme, this larger overall redemptive plan. And so this is probably the most common method uh, because the apostles themselves used it frequently as they moved from the Old Testament to preaching Jesus Christ. Take note of the unfolding plan of God that finds its climax in Christ. It's called Christocentric because Christ is the heart of redemptive history at every point. Did you hear that? All of redemptive history points 
climaxes in Jesus Christ. Now, it's to the glory of God the Father, there's no doubt. Uh, but nevertheless, um, all of redemptive history, from Genesis to Revelation, they climax in Christ, okay? And so, take note of the un unfolding plan of God. And so, it's easy to move, for example, from a book like, I don't know, Esther, to Jesus Christ. Isn't it the book of Esther that does not mention God's name one time? Is that right? Is that correct? Um, so how do you move from the book of Esther to Jesus Christ? First of all, it's hard to even move from Esther to a theocentric view of talking about God the Father because he's not mentioned there. Uh, and even more difficult perhaps to move from the book of Esther to not only God the Father but God the Son. How do you do it? Well, by the way of redemptive historical progression. That book is placed there for a reason and it's placed in a literary context in terms of the canon, but it's also placed there um, historically. And so to move from Esther to Christ is easy using this method. You ready for this? Basically what you have in the book is Satan trying to exterminate the Jewish people, the seed of God, because he wants to stop the Messiah from coming forth. If he can exterminate the Jews in the Old Testament, the Abrahamic covenant cannot be uh, fulfilled and kept, and um, Jesus Christ can't be born. So there's an assassination attempt right there in the book of Esther to stop the plan of God, to thwart the plan of God. And God's preservation through Mordecai, through Esther, of the Jewish people is about preserving the seed. You see, when you've got an Esther and you've got the Jewish people, then you've got a David. And you've got, I mean, I mean you, can run, you can run it all, run the line all the way through, uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, you've got a son of David, let me put it that way. Are y'all tracking with me today? So it's the way of redemptive historical pro progression. Just look at where the narrative or the, the pericope fits in its overall context. Okay? Number two, you've got the way of promise fulfillment. Here's another way you can get to Christ from the text in the Old Testament. Redemptive historical progression. Number two, the way of promise fulfillment. Okay? By the way, the way of promise fulfillment is not outside of the way of redemptive historical progression. Uh, in other words, redemptive historical progression, that meta narrative, that framework, um, is the foundation for the way of promise and fulfillment way of um, reaching Christ. Let me put it this way. Promise fulfillment looks at redemptive history and connects the promise made in the Old Testament, and by the way, there are a lot of promises in the Old Testament, and it connects the promise made in the Old Testament with the fulfillment of Christ in the New. Okay? And so this is the way of promise fulfillment. This covers both the broad and general scope of the Old Testament pointing towards Christ as well as those specific instances where there are Old Testament promises fulfilled in the New Testament. Okay? So you can go the way of redemptive historical progression route, look at the meta narrative and say, here's where this connects with Christ. Or you can go, hey, there's a promise back here. Christ is the fulfillment of that. Okay? And so um, uh, you've got, for example, a number of ways of doing biblical theology. Um, I'm a um, progressive dispensationalist, okay? I believe that we should look at the Old Testament from the viewpoint of especially the covenants that are found there, okay? And those covenants build progressively, pointing towards one person who's going to fulfill those covenants, the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And that's a way of doing biblical theology, and there are a number of promises made back there to Abraham. How do I preach on Abraham? The Abrahamic promise, promise is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Okay? The Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled in 
Jesus Christ. And again, you can, you, there are a number of uh, promises back there that you can um, <clears throat> preach Christ from in the Old Testament. Okay? Um, the third way, and by the way, before we move on there, let me just say this. Um, you can find your fulfillment in, in Christ, for example, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, the, what's called the proto, the first gospel, proto evangelion, I guess, of the, uh, you know, that first promise there, the seed that's promised there in Genesis 3.15, climax is in Christ. Whereas the Christocentric idea carries the idea of Christ being the center of all the scriptures, some prefer when they use this method, not in saying, well, I don't, I don't want to call what I do a Christocentric um, hermeneutic, but what they what they prefer to use is the term Christotelic because Christ is the telos or the end goal to which all the scriptures point. And by the way, it's not whether the scriptures are Christocentric or whether they're Christotelic. Are you ready for this? They're both. So um, those that prefer the Christotelic lens uh, to point to Christ, they use this um, they use this uh, way, of way of promise fulfillment um, as a way of reaching their destination. And so it's, a, it's easy to move, as I said earlier, to, for example, Abraham's promise to Christ. Okay, let's move on for the sake of time. Number three, the way of typology. The way of typology, okay? Since redemptive history contains so many similarities between redemptive acts... Typology is the tracing of the con constant principles of God's working in history, revealing a reoccurrent rhythm in past history that is, taking up more, that is taken up more fully and perfectly in gospel events. Okay? Um, it's essentially an analogy of redemptive events. Uh, a type is more than just a uh, minor parallel, okay? Um, as the writer of Hebrews does, it's easy to move, for example, from the high priest in the Old Testament to Christ. Why? Because the high priest is a type. Uh, it's easy to move from the high priest, the type in the Old Testament, to Christ Jesus, the anti-type in the New Testament. Or, for example, the Passover lamb found in Leviticus, if you can't move from the Passover lamb to Christ because your hermeneutic does not allow you to do that, you need a new hermeneutic, more specifically one that's Christ-centered. Again, this is just looking at, and, and it's just uh, admitting the fact that in the scriptures there are types, there are shadows, especially in redemptive history, that clearly point to the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, I think that you, as a Christian preacher, you have every right in your Old Testament text to point out the fact that you've got a type here of the Lord Jesus Christ and use that as an opportunity then to springboard to talking about Christ. How is Christ the Passover lamb? Well, John said in John chapter 1, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins, not just of Israel, not just of one house like in Exodus, covering one house. Not just taking away the sins of Israel on Yom Kippur. But he takes away the sins of the whole world. And think about that for just a minute. And so there are clearly types that are found in the Old Testament that, uh, that, that are clearly fulfilled in the New. Okay? And um, have fun with that. Now, uh, does that mean that you use the text to find Christ under every tree or behind every bush as it's been said? No. You've got to be careful there. Uh, but I just want to say there are types, there are shadows that are there and you've got every right because I believe that the author has placed them there. Author small a, author capital A. Remember, we've got more than one author here, if I can use that terminology. Not just the biblical author, but remember, the Holy Spirit of God is the one that weaves the Old Testament together with the New. And so there are types there. 
there are shadows in the Old Testament that you've got every right to say, you know, um, the Passover lamb here, Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb spoken of in the New Testament and, and, and to springboard uh, into a Christological discussion and especially a redemptive opportunity there for you. Uh, let me give you another, an odd one. What do you do with the cities of refuge in the Old Testament? You just talk about Old Testament history? No, there's a shadow there. There's a type there. Are you ready for this? The type, uh, the, old, the, the cities of refuge are a type of Christ. The ark in Noah's day is a type of Christ. Now, again, you don't want to press that too far. Uh, but the reason I say that and I, that I'm certain about those, th both of those illustrations and, and, and um, both of those examples is this. You ready for this? The New Testament uses those in that way. Jesus is the ark of safety. Uh, Jesus is the city of refuge that you flee to for salvation. Uh, I was preaching on uh, Noah's ark um, one, one, one Sunday and... Um, had an older woman literally run down the aisle, tears running down her cheeks, grab me by the shoulders, almost knocked me over the altar. Tears running down her cheeks. Here's what she was crying in my ear. I need to be saved. I need to be saved. And here's what she said. I'm not in the place of safety. I'm not in the place of safety. Now, listen to me, friend. Uh, there's a lot that you can draw from Noah, Noah's ark. But you fall short not to let people know Jesus Christ is our ark of safety. And um, I'm so glad that day that God used his word to convict her of sin, of righteousness, and, and of judgment and save her by his grace. And so you've got the way of typology. Now, again, the contrast there is we're not talking about spiritualizing the text to get there. Um, we're not talking about getting there in a way that doesn't honor the text itself, uh, but to, you, you may use typology to get there. I do agree with Gradanus on that particular point. Okay, then number four, you've got the way of analogy. Okay? Analogy consists of clear similarities between the Old and New Testament that may be highlighted in order to move to the greater, namely Christ. In other words, what God was for Israel is what God through Christ is for the church. Okay? Uh, so it's the way of analogy. You've got, and I wish I had a blackboard up here, you've got in the Old Testament, God, theos, that's a Greek word. <laughs> um, you've got Yahweh, you know, you've got Elohim or El, God up here, um, speaking to who? Who's the primary audience in the Old Testament? Israel. His redemptive people, right? Okay? Uh, making covenants with them, which by the way, He is fulfilled and will continue to fulfill in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you've got in the Old Testament. You've got God speaking to Israel um, and redeeming Israel by His grace. By the way, salvation in the Old Tes Testament is the same as it is in the New. By grace through faith. By grace through faith. All right? Now, you've got that. On the other hand, we're not preaching to an Old Testament community. They're not under the Old Covenant. I'm preaching to a New Covenant community. Right? That God in the Old Testament is clearly revealed as triune, even though it's in the Old Testament as well. You can see it. But the second person of the Godhead, Jesus, is explicitly known in the New Testament. And for my new covenant believer. And so it's not just God speaking to Israel. It's God's son speaking to who? Who's the, uh, who, are the, who, who are the main recipients of uh, the body of new covenant work? The church. Okay? So you've got God the Father through his son speaking to not Israel in the Old Testament per se, but to the church. Are you all tracking with me? And um, we're talking about two different eras, two different dispensations, if you will, okay? Um, and so how do I handle preaching Christ from this old covenant body of work we call the Old Testament? 
One way is by way of analogy. Okay? Um, it's the same God in the Old Testament. That's the same God as the God in the New. We're not Martianites. Uh, by the way, Yahweh in the Old Testament, that's Jesus. That is Jesus. And so it's easy to go from a, even if you say, well, I, I, I'm more of a theocentric guy. Let's talk about God here. That is, it's easy to make the connection between God the Father in the Old Testament and Jesus Christ in the New. Remember, Jesus is the one that reveals God the Father. So by way of analogy, ready? You can make an analogy between Israel and the Old Testament and your modern day church under a new covenant. Did you know that you can make the analogy there? And so you can draw a line, a um, line from the old covenant redemptive people of God, Israel, and the church. Okay, you can draw analogies there. They were saved by the shed blood of an innocent lamb out of Egypt. Guess what? We are saved by the shed blood of an innocent lamb. And so there are analogies there, there uh, that you can draw. Ready? The church is not Israel. We're not Israel. But are you ready for this? I am a member in many ways of, the, uh, of Israel through the covenants. Okay? Um, and so there, are, there is an analogy that you can draw in what God was doing with ethnic, national Israel and the promises made to them. And what the promises that God has made to the church through Christ. Which, by the way, apply to Israel as well. Okay? Analogies. God is the same from the Old Testament to the New. The salvation is the same. I, I, I mean, you can just, you can find these analogies, analogies all over the Old Testament. Uh, take the narrative behind the book of Hosea, for example. Take Hosea. How do you preach Hosea? God's hesed, his redemptive love. Hey, here's how you do it. You ready? You talk about Hosea, the faithful lover of an unfaithful bride. You talk about Gomer. Then you, you want to know what you do? You pull back the hair on Gomer and you tell your people to take a high definition zoom and look in Gomer's face. You want to know why? Because what they're looking at is not Gomer. They're looking at a mirror. They're looking at themselves. We are the unfaithful bride. But then, hallelujah, take a high-definition zoom and look at Hosea. And he is Jesus Christ, the faithful lover of an unfaithful bride. And so that's how you do it. For analogy, you uh, preach Christ from the Old Testament. We are the bride of Christ. Israel was the bride of God in the Old Testament. That's an analogy. Go there. Do it for the glory of God. Number five, you got what uh, Gradanus calls longitudinal themes, okay? Uh, these are major themes that have their beginning and roots in the Old Testament. By the way, if, if you're sitting there going, hey, some of these things seem to overlap, you're exactly right. Gradanus said they overlap greatly. And so... Um, it's not as if you've got six distinct ways. Many times these things overlap, and a long, long, longitudinal theme uh, is one of those that um, certainly overlaps uh, with um, especially the way of analogy. But watch this. Longitudinal themes are major themes that have their beginning and roots in the Old Testament, and they're easily traced into the New Testament and specifically to Christ. Themes like redemption. Themes like substitution. Hey, friend, when you find substitution in the Old Testament, what a great opportunity to talk about the greatest substitution of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay? It's a theme that's clearly there. And by the way, I believe it's put there by the author, capital A, of the text. Uh, when, and Dr. Allen will talk about this later, when Abraham... Uh, is going to sacrifice Isaac, and God provides a substitute there. Preach Jesus. <laughs> All right. Um, and so th this is the way you do it, by these longitudinal themes. Um, um, 
themes like redemption, substitution, re ransom, and sacrifice all find their fulfillment and climax in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch this. An example would be anytime someone is forgiven in the Old Testament. I'm preaching on Manasseh, for example, that wicked uh, king that sacrificed his children to Molech. Okay? I'm preaching on wicked Manasseh. Wicked Manasseh is saved. Um, by the way, he's the one that is credited with taking Isaiah the prophet and sawing him asunder. All right? I'm preaching on that king. Manasseh is saved. He's forgiven. God graces him in that Babylonian prison cell, raises him, him up, and brings him back to Jerusalem, a, a, a new creation, if you will, because of the grace of God working in his life. Are you all tracking with me? If I can't move from the forgiveness that Manasseh found to the forgiveness that Christ Jesus offers in the New Testament, then I am hermeneutically shackled and unable to be a Christian preacher. And so use these longitudinal themes. In other words, listen, salvation is by grace through faith in the Old Testament. Don't be afraid to say, hey, um, here's Manasseh. He was forgiven in the Old Testament. Guess what? Manasseh was forgiven. You ready for this? Watch, watch this theology. Watch, this, watch these hermeneutics. Manasseh was forgiven based on the same thing that you and I are forgiven by and from and in. Uh, how were the Old Testament saints, saints saved? How were they forgiven? They were saved on credit. I've got a credit card somewhere in here. Dave Ramsey, forgive me, but I, I've, got a, <laughs> I've got a credit card in here, you know. And uh, uh, the Old Testament saints were saved. They were forgiven prior to the cross based on the fact that Jesus Christ would come and die for their sins. And so they were saved on credit. There was going to be a, a um, there was going to be a, a time in which God would deposit in their account Jesus Christ. And therefore, he was able to extend to them forgiveness in the Old Testament. By the way, all the way back to Adam. How was Manasseh saved? Are you ready for this? By the blood of Christ. Now, he placed his trust in Yahweh. He placed his trust in the Lord. But soteriologically... He was saved because Jesus Christ was going to come. He was saved on credit. We, on the other hand, we're saved on debit. We're not looking forward. We're looking back to the cross. And so I've got every right to say the forgiveness that Manasseh was extended in the Old Testament, guess what? We can receive that same forgiveness today through the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so it's that longitudinal theme that runs from the Old Testament to Christ. What a road, amen? What a road. Uh, and then number six. Number six, and finally, the way of contrast. The way of contrast. Now, everything up to this point um, focuses in on the continuity between the Old Testament and Christ. Um, this is a neat way because this focuses in on the discontinuity between um, Christ and whatever text you're preaching. Okay? It's called the way of contrast. So an example would be the contrast found in how Israel in the book of Joshua was told to physically fight, drive out, and destroy their enemies. Okay, You're preaching on Joshua. God says, drive them out. God says, when you take Jericho, don't just send the JV team like you're going to send uh, to Ai. Uh, I want you to march around. I want you to get, give me your best. Take it by the grace of God. Don't take any spoil. Um, uh, drive them out. Utterly destroy them. I mean, you got you know all of that in the Old Testament. Uh, and so, a way to get to Christ is to um, is to show the contrast in what the Old Testament is saying, in terms of talking about physically fighting, driving out, or destroying their enemies, with the command that Christ came gave to his disciples to love their enemies. And to give them, instead of driving them out, the good news of the kingdom so that they might be saved. So that, do, do you see the contrast there? 
In other words, you're preaching on a text. God says, drive them out, destroy them. God says to Saul, utterly wipe them out. Even the children, if you will, wipe them out. <laughs> you know, and then I think you've got an opportunity to say there, you know, this is what God is saying under the old covenant in a specific situation with Israel. Here's the reason he's doing it, explaining it, exposing that prickly to your people, and then by saying this, however, in the New Testament, we are not called to drive out our enemies. We are called to love our enemies, as Jesus Christ, the Master, told us. And we are called not to destroy them, but we are called to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, it's that way of contrast between what God is saying in the Old Testament and um, what God reveals to us through Jesus Christ in the New. And so chapel is correct to preach Christ, and I'm talking about Brian Chapel here in Christ Center preaching. To preach morality apart from Christ is law. And um, Christ is the contrast of this idea. He's the contrast of law. Okay? So um, here it is. If you're preaching the Old Testament and you preach law to your people, and you miss the opportunity to say, this is the law under the old covenant. If you miss that opportunity to say, however, we as Christians are not under the old covenant. We are under the new covenant. We have the Spirit of God indwelling us. We've got the promise of Christ Jesus to return for us. And we're not under law. We're under grace. If you don't use that opportunity as a contrast, then you're going to preach law. You're going to preach morality. And um, you're going to miss an opportunity to preach the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Well, I've got a third example here. My time is gone. I've got a third example here of a road taken in my famous, some might say infamous sermon, The Camels Are Coming, in Genesis chapter 24. And so since these guys are going to expound a couple of um, Old Testament passages for you to show you how this is done, um, I'll go ahead and pass over that for you today. Uh, save your questions for uh, the experts a little bit later, uh, and um, uh, you can ask our Old Testament guys anything you would like, okay? And uh, anyway, guys, thank you for listening. God bless you, okay? Preach Jesus. All right, let me get out of my way. <laughs> hey, wasn't that great? Thank you, Dr. Charette. That was very enlightening. Uh, we learned a lot, and uh, if you have some questions for him, he will be happy to catch you out here, and you can ask him anything you want to, but thank you for a wonderful presentation. You got to start it off well, so we appreciate that very much. We're going to take a break. We've got lots of goodies out there for you. Uh, the break is a 30-minute break, and so and you have the full 30 minutes, so right at uh, 1045, if you could reconvene right here promptly at 1045, we'll begin session number two. All right, go take that break and enjoy it.